Hi, Ruha. Welcome to Network Capital. I'm so excited uh, to host you on our masterclass today. You've had a multidimensional, multimodal career uh, spanning various industries. So could you just give us a flavor of how this journey from being a doctor to a policy person, then going to policy school and thereafter being an entrepreneur, how did all of this come together? We'll explore in this podcast uh, and podcast. But uh, tell us at a very high level who you are and uh, what do you do? All right. First of all, thanks, Utkarsh, for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruha. And like Utkarsh mentioned, I have, I won't use the word pivoted. I've moved from being a clinical medicine doctor to working in public health, then eventually coming from my public policy to Harvard and then starting my own social startup. And if I think what the common thread was for all of this was basically my true north. I've always cared about social impact and you can see that. So I chose the field of medicine because of the kind of depth of impact that you can have for life. And during medical school, Utkarsh, they actually teach you something called preventive and social medicine. And out of the five mm -hmm. and a half years of MBBS, you're taught this subject for three and a half years. And I loved preventive and social medicine, also known as community medicine. It, teaches you about health systems at a broader level. It almost made me realize that what we do as doctors sometimes is just putting a band-aid, whereas the problem really lies within the larger healthcare system with regards to access to healthcare and social determinants of healthcare, such as education, employment, and income. So being taught that subject for three and a half years had a huge influence on me, and so did my head of department or my HOD, sorry. So that pulled me into health systems. That's how I got into public health. And then I eventually came for my public policy master's and not a public health master's because I wanted to intentionally take a more interdisciplinary approach on health. And yeah, that's how I landed at Harvard. And my two years over there opened up so many windows and opportunities and made me really be able to pinpoint at the cause that I cared most about, which is the problem statement of Led by Foundation. It's the underrepresentation of Indian Muslim women in the private sector. Yeah, we're gonna unpack this uh, during the course of this discussion. Uh, tell me, um, in college, you obviously were moved by community health. What did you do right after? And talk to us about your pre-policy school uh, experience. All right, so I went to Lady Harding Medical College in Delhi. It's a fantastic college. It's over 100 years old. It's all girls. I didn't go to an all girls school, but it was an interesting experience because there was a sense of greater comfort for sure being in an all girls college. And coming to the medical aspect of it, it was an academically very rigorous college, but there were very little avenues to express yourself or to create your holistic personality. And after grinding for years for my pre-medical entrances, when I finally got into medical school, medical college, I really wanted to explore debating, editorial skills, things that I was always interested in, but couldn't take out time because I was studying. So during medical school itself, I started creating communities, organizations, and clubs, which didn't exist. So set up the magazine committee, set up the debating society, was also an active part of the students' union, trying to create more avenues for young doctors to express themselves. And the thinking behind that was, in this day and age, you can't be hyper-focused on your skills or your profession if you really want to create information and disseminate it and be at the 1% of your profession. So even as a doctor, you should be able to have the presence to go and give a presentation on a new research that you've done and be able to share it with the world. So that's where I was coming from in medical school. It was a great right. experience, did well academically, was able to set up a couple of clubs and organizations that run to this date. So they've had like 10 odd editions of the magazine out, I believe. And right after medical school, I was practicing as a junior physician in Delhi itself. And what struck me most was that while working, whether I was working at the government or I was working at a private health clinic that was meant for people with low income, there was a real overrepresentation of Muslims because this was either cheap or free healthcare being provided. And the population that was coming in over here did not have the wherewithal to go to any other place. So these are some mm -hmm. of the things that moved me. I 
the two things I want to highlight over here are quite disparate, but shaped me quite a bit, which is creating organizations or clubs and something as small as creating a magazine club stayed with me because when we were launching the first magazine, it was basically my idea. And for the forward, what I did with Kush was I probably wrote emails to over a hundred eminent persons in India. Nobody replied except one person who replied not even with, hey, can you give me more details? He replied with the written forward, which was clearly specifically written for Lady Harding students. And it was by the former president, APJ Abdul Kalam. So to have him just reply to this cold email gave me so much energy and encouragement that I think it kind of kept me going easily for a decade. And the second thing I wanted to highlight was just the things I saw as a medical student and as a doctor in terms of the population that I was serving, which is again, something that I carry with me. Wow, that's phenomenal getting a reply from the president. That must have been uh, quite an inspiring experience. So you were a practicing physician and uh, you were obviously very interested in social issues, policy issues. What happened after? Um, what made you uh, think through the next steps in your career? So I was very intentional about practicing medicine for a little bit because I wanted to take my clinical skills and put them in my long-term memory, even though I knew I eventually wanted to get pulled into more health systems work. So after a couple of years of that, I moved into the public health space working for an international health NGO called the Clinton Health Access Initiative, where I worked very closely with the government to strengthen and add to existing health systems. So that's how the pivot happened. It wasn't, again, I'm not a big fan of the word pivot, but that's how the transition happened. It was very intentional. And the way you can see my journey is clinical medicine to then public health by working for a large NGO that provides healthcare services and supports healthcare systems. And then I worked for the government which sets policies essentially and then while I was at Harvard, I spent my summer interning at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is arguably the world's largest donor for healthcare. So all these different aspects for me shaped up in an image of a dining table. So I wanted to see what each seat at this table of public health feels like. So as a provider, I was a doctor, worked for a grantee organization, which is the Clinton Health Access Initiative, worked for the policymaker, which is the government, and then worked for the largest donor. I do think it's possible to have multiple loves in your life and to be able to do justice to all of them. So public health will always hold a very, very big space in my heart. And that's what I spent my time doing prior to Harvard, essentially. So in a way, it has been a constant, right? Um, uh, transitioning from public um, being a doctor to getting into health systems. How easy or difficult was it? Uh, to break into say Clinton Global Health Initiative and uh, the government thereafter. Yeah, so thanks for noticing that there is a common thread and that's why I'm not a big fan of the word pivot. I think if your true north is pulling you, there will be a lot of sense in what might seem like disparate associations or professions. But to answer your question, how did these transitions even happen? I think it happened mostly because I was completely okay with starting from the bottom because every time you move to an organization at that level, right after a bachelor's, albeit what I did was a professional degree, you do start from the bottom. And just this absolute zeal to learn. So it was with regards to the work, not that hard because I just was a sponge and I wanted to take in as much as I could. As for getting in, I did hustle quite hard. With Clinton, I networked, tried to know people, talk to people who worked there and then get basically an interview and then try to convert the interview to a job. With the government of India, it was kind of tricky because I think 8,000 people applied for these 30, 20 spots that they had for policy professionals to come in. So the getting in requires hustle, requires preparation. But I think what is more important is how you deliver at the job and you have to have this mentality if you are moving that you're gonna to have to start from the bottom, but starting from the bottom is incredibly valuable. You learn so much and it comes to support you as you move forward and maybe transition into other things. Yeah, I can totally add. And I really love the analogy of being a sponge because uh, you have to absorb and then deliver. So when you think of say, um, 
Clinton Global Health Initiative. What kind of projects uh, uh, you worked with and uh, what did you learn from them? So I think I might have been the first or second medical doctor that this health NGO hired. It was full of ex-management consultants. So the great thing over there was I got to learn a lot from my peers, learn Excel modeling and making PowerPoints, which was actually very useful. Um, and I used those skills to the date. One project that comes to mind is we were working with the government of Madhya Pradesh and talking about fortified salt being distributed through their PDS or public distribution system shops. Now these PDS shops would sell highly subsidized salt, which is fortified or enriched with iron and that would help address anemia and maternal anemia causes around 30 to 40% of maternal deaths either directly or indirectly. So there's a very low cost intervention but a lot of planning had to go around it. You had to understand what is the manufacturing capacity of Madhya Pradesh and neighboring states? What would transportation cost? What would be the cost of enriching it? Are there multiple ways of doing it? How do you launch it? Which districts or villages or towns do you start with? So I managed to, through a couple of months, put all of this together, worked very closely with the government and the relevant departments. But then I moved on from Clinton to Niti Aayog, to the government of India, and public health initiatives take time. So I was at the beginning of this salt enrichment with iron movement in Madhya Pradesh in terms of actually having it delivered through the government. Having spent maybe eight months over there working on this project specifically, I then moved on to Niti Aayog. And I remember very distinctly a couple of months into Niti, I get a call from the Department of Civil and Food Supplies. And they tell me, They'd say my name and they're like, I don't know if you remember me, but you used to sit in my office every day last summer. And I just wanted to tell you that the program that you created for launching the salt enriched program of Madhya Pradesh has gotten the green light. And that I think impacted over a hundred million people. It was some insane number, but to see a public health intervention from absolute start to actually delivering was so incredibly rewarding. And the numbers were incredibly obscene, the number of people who would be having a more wholesome diet with their iron taken care of and in turn helping decrease maternal deaths was absolutely thrilling. One of the um, benefits of uh, working in such large systemic initiatives is that you just get to understand scale beyond textbook. And that must have been a, a pretty important learning as you worked in the government. So how does the nature of your job evolve from Clinton Global Health to NITI? And what did you, what kind of projects were you enrolled in at NITI? And uh, were there some lessons that you took forward from Clinton Global Health Initiative that were useful for you to do your job better at NITI? So NITI Yoga was a very interesting experience, mostly because the space that they had created for consultants and young professionals such as me was very new. And with the right kind of mentorship, you were allowed a lot of latitude to do things. And I was fortunate enough to get great mentorship at Niti Aayog. Got to dabble in a bunch of projects from the first state health index report to working on setting up the indicators of the aspirational district program. So the 31 health and nutrition indicators was something that I worked on creating. What my takeaway from Neeti was, it really helped me understand the pulls and pressures of the government. It is really, really easy to criticize the government when you're outside of it. And as a policy enthusiast, I have done that, but I think I came out more empathetic towards the government after my time at Neeti Aayog. The pulls and pressures are very real and there are a lot of competing interests over there that need to be juggled. As for what I took from Clinton, I think Clinton gave me the opportunity to work with the state government and also see how rollouts happen at the grassroots level. So just having that image while you're sitting at the apex public policy think tank of the government was really useful. And uh, how did the thought of going to policy school enter? Because uh, you're already uh, in a pretty, I would say, scalable uh, position, a position where you can develop and deliver scalable projects. Why do policy school at all? So I distinctly remember thinking about policy school back when I was in 11th class. I think I had just discovered who Shashi Tharoor was and learned about his degree 
called it MALD from Fletcher's and I'm like, that sounds awesome. I want to do that. And when I was reading more about Fletcher's, I learned about the Harvard Kennedy School and I'm like, that program sounds interesting. But my first love was health and medicine. So I went, continued studying for my pre-med, did all of that. But like I said, your true north just keeps pulling you and will catch up with you or you will catch up with it eventually. And that's what ended up happening. When I was at Neeti, I realized that I was getting a better sense of how things work in the healthcare system. But I did want to, like I mentioned, have a more interdisciplinary lens on things. And I think policies are incredibly powerful tools to bring about change at scale, like you mentioned. And that's how I got pulled into policy and went there for a two years master's program. And, um, how did you decide to pick the schools, pick the programs? Because within policy also, there is a wide range of things that one can choose to focus on. How, what was the process like? I think a lot of it has to do with what the candidate wants out of the experience. So for me, it was really important to get access to as many resources. And the resources at Harvard University are completely unparalleled. If you want to go in for academics, if you want to have a very international bent, if you want to work on energy, you might want to rethink which school you want to go to. But for somebody like me who was very clear with what I wanted out of my master's experience, I think Harvard was a no-brainer. It gives you fantastic resources and opportunities. It is such a magnet for international personalities to come and speak. And I'm a big fan of public lectures. Like prior to Harvard, you could see me at India International Center or IHC once a week easily attending some public lecture. So the Kennedy School has a stellar system of attracting people to their forums to have um, these conversations. So those are some of the things that attracted me. It was mostly the resource and the exposure that that school gave. So what did you study? Public administration or public policy? And what's the difference between both? That's a great question. I did not have a lot of insight when I applied. All I knew was the master's in public policy, and that's what I applied for. So happy to take space right now and tell folks about it. So there are essentially four degrees that you can get at the Harvard Kennedy School. You have the master's in public policy, MPP. You have the master's of public administration, MPA. Then you have the Masters of Public Administration slash International Development called the MPA ID. And then you have the Mid-Career Masters in Public Administration and MCMPA. That's a lot of um, alphabets and I practically made a soup out of that, but it's quite simple. So you have the MPP, which is what I did. It's meant for early career folks. I was towards the older age group for my badge. I think the average age is getting younger and younger around 23 or 24 now. So I would say, if you are planning, don't think you're too young, go ahead and do it. The MPP has year one with a core curriculum. So you don't get to choose your subjects necessarily. And year two, you get to fill up your calendar based on your interests. So you decide your own curriculum, that's MPP. With MPA, that is meant for people who are coming in for their second masters, I believe. Um, and the MPA ID is for somebody who is interested in international development and it's a very rigorous curriculum. It's very quant and econ heavy. And I think you do need to have a background in one of those subjects to apply for it. And the fourth one is the mid-career program. That's usually when you hear of IS officers going to the Kennedy School, they're coming here for this one year mid-career program. And you need to have at least eight years of experience to apply for that. Again, please cross check all of these facts. It's been a while since I read the brochure, but more or less, this is what it's like. Got it. No, this is super helpful because people often um, want to think through these issues and distinctions, which are subtle, but uh, important to know while one considers. So um, you got in, uh, it must have been a very special feeling and um, you know, also a validation of all the effort and time that you've put into, um, you know, the many years of work experience and studying. So um, give us a flavor of what your two years were like, what were some things that jumped out and uh, help our listeners understand the journey of a policy school student. Sure. I just want to say that you did really hit it on the nail when you said, all my experience must have paid off. And it really did. I made sure that my application literally covered my entire life in one way or another. And it really was not the three months of preparation for GMAT and my application that got me into Kennedy. 
it was the 28 years before that that got me into Kennedy. So anybody thinking of applying, share your life story. That's what makes you unique. As for how the two years at Kennedy were, they were interesting. Uh, the first three semesters or three quarters of the entire experience was pre-COVID and the final quarter was COVID. But I was quite happy that I got to experience that. So I can speak a little bit to how the virtual or remote schooling experience was vis-a-vis -vis being in person. The TLDR version of this is, it was fantastic. It was an incredibly stimulating environment, completely worth everything that they ask of you. It was stimulating not only because of the professors who are freaking amazing and so responsive. It wasn't just amazing because of the administration the entire university administration makes it very clear that they're there for you. Again, very responsive, constantly trying to make life easier for you. And no matter where you are, if you're traveling for work, for Harvard, um, on a school trek, while you are an active student of Harvard, they take really good care of you and are very supportive. So the, you have the professors, you have the admin, then you have your peers or your fellow students who for me was, they were like reading a book. Let me explain that a little bit. So the reason I, I'm absolutely in love with the Harvard Kennedy School especially is every time you spoke with someone, their eyes would first of all, just light up when they're talking about their story. And in those two, three, five minutes of interaction, it would really just feel like reading an incredibly engrossing book because everybody at the Kennedy School is just so passionate about the purpose or the social issue that they're trying to solve, it's, it's electric to be there. So that's, I think, the main things that stood out for me. Like I mentioned previously, the school attracts a lot of great speakers that would come and fill up our stage maybe once, twice, thrice a week. And you had all these events going on. But definitely the admin itself, the professors, and then the students were just incredibly, incredibly amazing. So let's unpack that. That one key takeaway is, of course, the student experience. The other is uh, the academic experience, which includes the guest lectures, guest professors, so forth. Um, but you also need to um, constantly be thinking about your professional next steps. And um, as we are given to understand, in policy school, you have to, uh, in a way, create it. It's uh, everyone is trying to do something specific but it's yeah. not often out there. So yeah. how did you go about thinking through your internship? Um, what was the process like? And uh, how did you end up where you ended up? That's a great question. So I was very clear on why or what I wanted out of Harvard Kennedy. As I'd also mentioned previously in terms of why I chose a public policy course over a public health course. Now, during orientation, one of the things that they tell you is being at Kennedy, sorry, being at Kennedy is like drinking from a waterfall. There is just so much and there's only so much that you can take and consume. So I was very intentional and had a list of five or six things that I wanted to achieve slash do during my two years at Harvard. And also while getting into school, the main reason I wanted to get into Harvard Kennedy School and the way I decided which schools I wanted to your earlier question, just adding on a little bit more was I wanted to work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to really complete that round table that I was talking about, the experience of public health through the different seats. So the Gates Foundation selects or allows interns to apply only from a limited number of schools. And from what I knew while I was applying, the Kennedy School was one of them. After I get into the Kennedy School, that web page seems to have disappeared, which told me about which schools can apply to the Gates Foundation. And the revamped webpage did not have the Kennedy School on it. From Harvard, only the Harvard Public Health School and the Business School could apply for internships. But I really, really wanted to experience what working at the Gates Foundation was. So what I did was I was trying to make up my own internship and I was trying to still continue trying to figure out how do I get into Gates. So I spoke with a lot of people. I realized that Sometimes you could have a little role created for yourself if you know somebody, but those are not at the headquarters of Gates, which is in Seattle. So what I did was 
I was talking to a friend of mine and at that point I was in the final round of interviews for McKinsey because everybody applies to McKinsey. So you can follow up on that later. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was doing his MBA from Duke, which is a school that Gates takes interns from. And he wanted to get into McKinsey and was being interviewed for the Gates Foundation. So we were just laughing how I was probably getting his dream role and he was getting my dream role. But I asked him if he could put in my CV with the campus recruiters of Gates at Duke. And he did that. And this was in January. I went on with my own internship recruiting process. Internships were supposed to start in May. And I had my internship all panned out. I was thinking of doing management consulting and sometime working in South America's public healthcare systems and their government. And then in April, I get a call from the Gates Foundation saying that there is this internship role that they're hiring for and they really like my CV and wanted to talk to me about it. And that's how it happened. I had three or four interviews in a week and then got my job offer by the end of the week for that. It was a fantastic experience at Gates, but I think the lesson from this was it's really important to identify your needs and put them out there. It's something that helps me as an entrepreneur also when fundraising, what I really strongly believe is talk about your work, talk about what you do, and then hope or pray that it will land on the right ears and you will find a good donor or a funder. And that's how it happened with my internship as well. Put your need out yeah. there, hopefully fall on the yeah, right yeah. ears. We talk about luck surface area a lot on network capital, which is basically an intersection of um, um, doing great things and telling lots of people. And at some some point, somewhere, um, you know, you do get quote unquote lucky uh, in terms of it. But a lot of it is intentional. So you designed it. We can clearly see. But um, just um, sort of um, double clicking into two aspects of what you said. First is. Um, the internship application or generally the job prospects that are available. Um, and second is what you actually learned at the Gates Foundation. Yeah. So as an Indian student, what are the broad macro options available for people to consider recruiting? Because you mentioned everybody applies to McKinsey. Mm -hmm. um, so help um, our listeners and understand uh, what the recruiting landscape look like for uh, for obvious options like what do people actually do if they're not totally clear which direction they want to go into so yes there are two segments one is whether you're clear on what you want and you're not if you're clear you can tailor make the harvard experience to really get into the niche that you want to go into but utkarsh your question is on what if you're not clear and what are the broad themes that you can do then so the broad themes uh, would be three folds one would be the private sector. So you get into the corporate space. Management consulting is a big option that people like because of everything from the job security, it's good money, it's fantastic training, and there's often great branding associated with it. The second option is the public sector. And in terms of the public sector, you mostly have governments. People in America are also really big on working with city and state governments. And I've had Indian friends who've applied for such roles as well and work for city or state governments after graduating from Kennedy. And then the third is the not-for-profit space where a lot of Kennedy school folks go into. These include everything from policy think tanks to grassroots NGOs. And again, depending on what industry is your, exp uh, sorry, your preference, you could find something over there. So that's how we usually bucket the three possible sectors for internships and jobs. Got it. So you get a dream dream internship, clearly a very sought after internship, an internship which, in a way, you were not even eligible for because of the change in the school yeah. list. Um, how were the two months or three months in Seattle? And um, did you learn something new about yourself or the healthcare system or policy system? Mm -hmm. A couple of stories come to mind. So the three months at the Gates Foundation in Seattle were a fantastic and very steep learning curve. So they select 25 interns for the headquarters every year, and you are put into a particular team, have a very defined role and project to deliver. I had a role which was really at the intersection of technical and strategy. So the technical team at Gates is made up of doctors and industry experts, 
the strategy team is usually made of consultants. And I was reporting to one person from both of these. The project itself was based on cervical cancer and it was a strategy on how to optimize or maximize vaccine delivery. It kind of um, also bears a lot of relevance in terms of the frameworks that we created for COVID now. The experience itself was one that was incredibly rigorous, very rewarding, and I got great exposure. So during my three months of Seattle, I also got to travel to South Africa and Kenya for Gates work and to talk to people, better understand trials that were happening over there. And in the end, be able to give an actionable piece of advice and a strategy document. What happened after the internship is also interesting with Crush. So based on my recommendations, there was another grant made to understand cervical cancer vaccination slightly better. And I was staffed on that grant. The grant itself was given to Yale University. So after Gates, I go back to my second year of Harvard, but I was now splitting my time between being a student at Harvard and being an employee at Yale, emanating directly from the Gates grant. So if you, again, if you do good work, you do get rewarded in that sense. And they decided to keep you on because of all of the information that I had been able to understand and gather and synthesize during my three months. Again, I cannot stress enough how rigorous it was and I freaking loved it. Towards the end of it, my manager told me that this project was actually made for a team of three McKinsey consultants. And that was really nice because I, in the middle, I was doubting my ability because I thought this is taking a lot of time to create, um, but it was good to know that it was supposed to be three people's full-time job that I managed to do in three months then by myself. That's incredible. That's really incredible. So um, the internship concludes and uh, you did get some scholarship as well, right? At some point during policy school, talk to us about the, what that scholarship is and how can students apply for such scholarships within school? So the story of how I realized the scholarship happened was also really funny because I understood it in two halves. So you get your results in mid-March and then two weeks later, you get your scholarship results. And these scholarship results are scholarships that Harvard gives itself. Otherwise you have other external opportunities. You have the World Bank scholarship and a few more that I can't recollect, but they're specific ones for India by Indian organizations. I had mostly applied for the Harvard University scholarships itself. And I'd worked equally hard, if not harder, with my scholarship application, which is a separate application than my MPP application. Anyway, mid-March, I get my results, I've gotten through Kennedy, super ecstatic. Two weeks later, the scholarship results are out. And the way they had it written, they had my first year's tuition written and said, um, this is your scholarship. So first year's tuition is like half of the full tuition, right? So I was like, cool, got a 50% off, not bad. Go back up, tell my parents, or like back up, I mean, where my parents' room was above my room. Uh, and I'm telling them that this is what happened. We're all super thrilled, chill, enjoy, have lunch. And I go back to my room and I open up the scholarship letter again. And then I realize it says, that's my scholarship for the first year, which means that I just got a full tuition scholarship from Harvard from the university itself, which is the most, one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, it's called, um, it's the president's fellowship itself. So it's given by Harvard's president and only 10 students get it. So that's the scholarship that I got. And it was- Phenomenal. Thank you. And it was a recognition of my public service background. Well, clearly well-deserved. Um, you've, you've really put in the hours and what it takes, um, plus your commitment shows, and I'm glad that uh, the president of Harvard recognized that. Um, so the internship's over, you're thinking through a variety of things. Um, there's consulting, there is the Gates Foundation, um, but the second year is also about thinking through next steps. What might one do after graduation? So what was on your mind? Did you wanna go back to Gates Foundation? Was that an option? Were you thinking of other things as well? And I do know that there was a lot of uh, follow-ups and hustle involved. So give us the flavor of what the due diligence and follow-up and hustle really looks like in the second year. Sure. So let's go to 2019. Let's put a timeline on all of this. I started Harvard 2018, August. I graduated 2020 May, two-year program. 2019 summer, say May to August, was spent at the Gates Foundation. 
Now, the summer happens right between your first and second year. And right before the summer began, I had applied for Harvard's Social Innovation Fellowship, which is a program that selects some 15 odd students from across the university and helps you take your social enterprise to the next level. Most of the people who get selected are people who have already been on the cover of Forbes, have raised millions of dollars for their social enterprise. I was, um, I was the person with, I have an idea. And they liked my idea enough to actually select me and make me part of this fantastic cohort that met every week and hustled super hard with being a Harvard student and trying to set up your own social enterprise or grow it. So I got selected the month before I started my internship at Gates. And the program itself of the innovation fellowship slash incubator, let's think of it as an incubator, that was supposed to start after my internship. But I spent a lot of my time during my internship trying to also build a base and understanding of the project that I had pitched to them, which was a leadership lab for Indian Muslim women, very different than the global health work that I was doing. So I would spend all day working at the Gates Foundation on my project and then still try to take out some time to be able to do a landscape analysis of the social enterprise idea that had recently gotten selected. So I come back to Harvard in August, September for my second year. So now I'm doing a couple of things. I am a full-time student. I am working at Yale University. I'm also co-chairing the largest India conference, which is the Harvard India Conference, a student-led India conference. And on top of that, I'm trying to set up my social enterprise. While all of this was happening, in terms of what my prospects for post-school were looking like, I was very, very interested in the social enterprise that I was setting up. I had at that point, no idea whether or not it could be something that I would think of full time, but I wasn't worried for two reasons. One is I didn't have student debt. And the second is whatever little debt I had in terms of living expenses, again, would have been supported by Harvard because they encourage people to take up not-for-profit roles or public sector roles and then help you with whatever little student debt you might have, or in my case, little, but even if it's larger, they help you with that. So that being said, I felt very comfortable. There wasn't much pressure. What I was thinking of in terms of Gates and management consulting was I absolutely loved my time at Gates. And I recognized as a while I did a project meant for McKinsey consultants that I would perhaps enjoy the management consulting training before I got back to the not-for-profit space. So I was prepping and McKinsey was a real full-time option but led by was where my heart was. And as you might have made out from listening to me for the past how many ever minutes is I've always been phenomenally passionate about the work that I do. And I love the work that I do. Led by is an act of nation building. It is something that originates from my own lived experiences and tries to basically address problems and provide a platform that I would have loved to have 10 years back. And I see that there is a phenomenal demand. So that's how Led by has come to take up all of my living, breathing space ever since I've graduated. So what is Led by? And um, when you were thinking through some of the design principles of uh, Led by, um, what came to your mind? So we, as a part of the incubator that I mentioned, which was this entirely co-curricular thing happening, had fantastic resources that came and helped us think through our theory of change, what success looked like. And I also had fantastic guides and the director of this particular incubator was somebody who helped me a lot. And as I thought about it, I narrowed down on my problem statement and realized that what bothered me the most was the underrepresentation of Indian Muslim women in important roles, especially in the private sector. So that's what we wanted to focus on as for design principles, I realized I did a lot of things with a subconscious framework. So I hadn't really thought about a framework, but in hindsight, I'm just like, okay, that kind of worked out in a very systematic fashion. But to start off, conversations, a lot of conversations. I do that for two reasons. One is it gets me information, but secondly, I also just love people and I love hearing stories. So that's helped a lot and I still go on and do that. Uh, most people are huge proponents of reading books and I love reading books and gaining knowledge, 
but my preferred source of knowledge is usually talking to people who've set up things, created things, and people kind enough to share that with me. So that's how the origin of led by structure happened. It's by talking to a lot of people who worked in the space of leadership, professional development, education management. No, give us, um, this is very, very useful for us to understand. Um, so now where are you in the led by journey and uh, what are some things that jump out to you, to you in terms of the hard stuff and some stuff that really energizes you? So in terms of led by, just a quick elevator pitch or recap of what we do is we are a leadership lab for Indian Muslim women. So we work with young college going or young professional Indian Muslim women and give them an ecosystem where they can find their tribe, they can find advisors, they can find role models, they get workshops and coaching from fantastic university professors from Harvard, MIT, Columbia. And the reason we're bringing all of this together is to help these young women find their network, find their tribe, and be able to contribute to their community and towards nation building. A big underlying tenet of this is with the way the world is, the youth cannot wait to become C-suite executives 10, 20, 30 years down the line and have a lot of money before they start actively thinking about how to contribute back to the nation or community. That needs to be done at a much earlier level. So that's what we're trying to instigate almost in terms of sparking young minds to be able to give back to the community and to the nation earlier. So we do this through an intensive fellowship program. The first cohort graduated in 2020. It was all virtual and I think we managed to do a pretty good job with the virtual community that we created. And now the second cohort is going to start this summer. So it's gonna be June, 2021. And for 30 odd spots, we've received 1200 applications, which again, just shows us a sense of demand that is being, or is there and is uncatered to so far. That's in terms of operations. In terms of team, we are right now a team of five full-time employees and then another five to seven interns that we take on a rolling basis. And then the third aspect, I think, which is really relevant for a startup, especially a social startup, would be funding. And we've recently received our first big donation of $150,000. So that's where we are. Congratulations. And um, we're given to understand it and also hiring. What do you look for when you partner or hire people and uh, how can people apply to support the mission and, uh, you know, partake of this very interesting opportunity? So, yeah, so we are looking at people who definitely have a fire in their belly and who are sponges at the same time. So somebody who really likes to hustle, who can work with ambiguous orders, who really understands that a startup is a very fluid place and a lot of things get thrown at you and you need to deliver quickly. You need to see your results. You need to learn whether you did well or not. And if you did not do well, learn your lessons and iterate and just do that over and over again. So hustlers with a fire in their belly who can take ambiguous orders would be the kind of folks that we take on. Fantastic. Um, so clearly, I mean, uh, you have been a very busy person for the past 10 years, perhaps even more. Um, what does work-life harmony mean to you, if anything? And uh, do you relax? If yes, how do you relax? And what's your advice to young people who um, are also looking to think through some of these issues? That's something that I'm very torn about because I know what works for me, but I'm not entirely sure that is something I would advise other people. So, so really, just talk to us about that then, what works for you? What works for me is um, I don't necessarily do work-life balance. I absolutely love my work. I love creating, I love spending time doing things that have positive social impact. So my work days are super long. I do still take out time to wedge out and watch TV. I really like exercising, so I take out time for that. But mostly it's, it's something that I don't strive to do. I know there are certain non-negotiables in my life. So an hour of working out, an hour of reading The Economist, and an hour of catching up with my family. But then the rest of the time is spent on work. Super. So um, this is an exciting part of your journey. You're about to scale the uh, 
funding or support for the mission is there. Um, what are you most looking forward to and what's something that uh, say perhaps you're nervous about? Okay, what I'm most looking forward to, I think I do have a very long-term vision of this. I can't say or speak to something I'm looking forward to in the next year or three years, but I'm very excited about seeing what India will look like, say 10 years down the line. So for instance, you know how most of our bank chiefs are these fantastic women in India? I want to start seeing that same thing happen in terms of Muslim women also. I want to start hearing more Muslim women names in senior level executive and leadership roles in India. And I'm really excited to see how we can meaningfully make that happen. How can we actually raise the representation of Muslim women to represent or to reflect the proportion of the population in these senior level roles? So we are 8% of India and hopefully we'll be 8% of the senior leadership in the corporate space in a decade's time. So that's what I'm looking forward to most. And I know it's a long road, but it's probably gonna keep me going for that long. Um, the second thing, the thing that we're nervous about or apprehensive about is it's hard to point or something. Either I'm just a very optimistic unicorn and rainbows kind of person, though I do want to take this question to maybe reflect on another thing that I've noticed is in terms of apprehension, I have been asked by many people what about the pushback that we're going to get because we're working for Muslim women. Now, although our target group is Muslim women, we are also making sure that our services are made available to everyone and that everyone also comes and helps solve this problem of underrepresentation. Because net net, it's really about a hundred million individuals. Forget Indian Muslim women, it's about a hundred million individuals, which is the population of Indian Muslim women who haven't had access to avenues and don't have the agency to really tap into their potential. And it's about lifting these 100 million people up to their potential so that they can really be engines of growth for the country. And a lot of people get that. So every time I'm asked about, oh, what about pushback now? My answer is, my true answer is that during the ideation phase, during the theory of change setting, during the design thinking of Ledby, I did think about pushback situations and how Ledby would react. But now with Ledby alive and thriving at this point of time, I am so happy that I have probably only been asked what about pushback than actually receiving any pushback. And my takeaway of late really has been that this big bad world that people talk about, it isn't that bad actually. So that's where we are right now. Phenomenal. I mean, uh, thanks so much for taking time out and sharing your journey and talking through the various career transitions and leadership journeys that you've been. Um, it's, it's always a delight to speak with people who love what they do and um, have made their curiosity their profession. So more power to you. And uh, we'll be sharing this on all our platforms and uh, look forward to supporting you wherever you go. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me, Utrash.